Thank you all so much for coming tonight. This is so exciting. And I just want to mention that this is our sixth program, the Laguna Beach Historical Society's sixth program for the year. It's the most programs we've done in a year. Um, and we welcome everybody to tonight's program, uh, November 8th, 2011. And um, I'm Kimberly Stewart, president of the Historical Society. And uh, on behalf of the entire board of directors, I want to welcome everyone again and thank you for attending and watching. Uh, again, uh, the program is being televised on uh, Cox Communications Local Channel 30. Um, I want to thank our city council for their continuing support of the Laguna Beach Historical Society Community Assistance Grant that provides us with the funds to continue putting on programs like this free to the public in the council chambers. And to thank Cox Communication for helping us organize the recording and, um, of this program tonight and televising it. The program tonight is entitled History Not Always Made by Committee by Arnold Haino. And it is moderated tonight by none other than our Historical Society board member, Gene Felder. Let's hear for Gene Felder. Extraordinaire. <laughs> Well, this promises to be a very important and interesting program tonight. We're so pleased that we we're able to put this together and make this happen. And I want to welcome Bonnie Haino um, for all of her support. Let's hear it for Bonnie, Bonnie Haino. Haino. <laughs> but as many of you may have read in the newsletter that came out uh, about our program tonight, um, Arnold Haino has been involved with our community for over 50 years and has done so many important things, been involved in environmental issues and political issues. And one of the highlights that he's very well known for his important role is in uh, making sure that the community has an overall building height ordinance, which is still in effect today. Uh, challenged ongoingly, but it still stands. And so we are so pleased to be able to discuss this issue and a number of other issues um, that are not only about Arnold Haino tonight, but so many important and interesting things about Laguna Beach. So with that, um, I'd like to just go ahead and hand it over to uh, Gene Felder and Th take it from here. Thank you very much, Kimberly, and welcome everybody. Uh, Arnold Haino, a history not always requires a committee. So uh, I understand, Arnold, uh, you came to Laguna Beach uh, September 1st, 1955. So what was it like coming to Laguna Beach? Uh, it was like uh, leaving the canyons of Wall Street where you have buildings and gutter, and that's called a canyon, uh, to coming to where the canyons really existed. It was all new to me. I had never, I had never lived in a house. I'd only lived in apartment buildings and never in, into a private house. Uh, we arrived on September 1st, and we rented a house on Gough Street that afternoon, uh, three bedrooms, a large uh, 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 yard for, for our puppy, uh, Cleo, a, a very lovely, very stupid beagle, uh, and our daughter, who was uh, a year and a half at that time, Laurel. Uh, what was it like? It, it was a town of 6,000 people. It, today it's 23,000, 24,000. So it's, that, it's, it's quadrupled, not really, because Bluebird Canyon was not included in that, uh, Arch Beach Heights was not included in that, and of course South Laguna was not included in that. So we've probably doubled the population, and not much more than that, in, in 50 plus years. Uh, it was a Republican town. Uh, people don't realize that they keep thinking of Laguna as being, oh, that outlandishly radical, liberal, democratic bastion in Orange County. It was Republican by about three to one back then, and uh, I was not used to that. Uh, uh, a, a good Jewish boy in New York City did not know one Gentiles and two did not, did not know Republicans. <laughs> and and uh, I, I found that, that uh, I was then being treated as, as an outlander and, uh, and, uh, and some sort of crazy radical because I was uh, Jewish and there was great anti-Semitism in Laguna at that time and I was a Democrat. Uh, Anne Christoph said to me, when did you arrive? I said September 1st. She said, uh, you had a letter to the editor uh, in November, uh, two months, and I said, what took me so long? 
uh, anyway, uh, uh, the, the town was not that much different. I, 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 it was the town of, 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 of beauty, the ocean and the hills and the town squeezed in between, uh, and it remains that. And uh, though we could walk barefoot and did, uh, uh, and we could do other things uh, of a laissez-faire nature, uh, uh, it was still, it's still just about what it was. We complained about parking back then, of course, and, uh, and that hasn't changed. But uh, what else? I don't know, Gene, but that's, what, do you have anything specific you want me to talk about, about then? Well, uh, you know, we think of Laguna Beach being wonderful, but uh, I think at one time you mentioned to me that there was a, a, a black neighborhood and that there was, uh, uh, you know, how were the blacks treated in Laguna Beach at that time, 1955 or so? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Ocean Avenue from where Anastasia now is on that side of the street down to where uh, uh, the, the zinc is. Uh, there were these small cottages and they were all inhabited by black residents. Uh, they owned some of the cottages and they rented some of the other cottages. There were probably 10 black families living there. Uh, there was also a, a black enclave in the canyon out in the uh, on Woodland Drive, Roosevelt Lane, uh, the Ferry Wood, uh, around there. So there were probably a total of 20 black families in Laguna Beach at that time. And we learned very quickly, I don't know why I always learn these things so quickly, it has something to do with, with uh, uh, be being tuned into the other, and uh, the black in this case was the other. And uh, black men could not get their hair cuts in barber shops in Laguna Beach. We had six barber shops, and they would not cut the hair of any black man in Laguna Beach. Uh, one black, uh, uh, Jim Jones, who was the unofficial mayor of Ocean Avenue, would come to uh, uh, Leo Phillipson's barber shop on, on Beach Street, and uh, once a month, uh, Leo would close the, the blinds at night and cut uh, uh, Jim Jones's hair uh, and uh, tell me how, how soft his hair was. It was much easier to cut his hair than my hair, he said, uh, but he didn't ban me. Uh, uh, the reason he, he was willing to cut uh, Jim Jones' hair was that Jim also cleaned out his, his barbershop every night. So uh, th th there was that, and uh, uh, it bothered me. So, so a few of us, Bonnie and I and, and, and some of the black families, I'll talk about the black families in, in a minute, uh, formed an organization called uh, 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 Laguna Beach, a, a, a committee of... Multi, biracial citizens committee or something like that to, to try to see what we could do about helping the the lot of the black families and in particular this one problem uh, we went to the barber shops and they just said well we can't cut that hair can't cut that kind of hair can't cut that hair uh, won't cut that hair uh, until finally one of the barbers said to me well you know if i cut that hair of that one black i'm going to lose my white uh, customers uh, before that, the blacks to get their haircuts went up to Long Beach or to uh, 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 Santa Ana for their haircuts, or their wives would cut their hair. Uh, so uh, I said, well, if all the barber shops cut the hairs of, of, of blacks, then, then where would the whites go to? I, I can't see them. There wasn't as much of that back in 1955. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you, I, wouldn't, I don't think the whites are going to go up to Long Beach or to uh, Santa Ana, uh, but they still, they still wouldn't do it. So we went to the police and we went to the press. I, I looked up the law and I found out there was a public accommodations law in 1905 that if you open f to the public, you cannot then discriminate against segments of the, of the public uh, uh, on rate, matters of race, religion, or national origin. And uh, so I, I, I told the cops that this is what was going on. And we arranged on a Saturday afternoon at two o'clock to march a black and a white into every barber shop in Laguna Beach, telling the cops first and the press also to be there. And they were in some of the barber shops. And we did that and we, we, uh, we cracked that ban that afternoon. The black families, uh, Besides Jim Jones, who, who was the mayor, I have no idea what Jim did for, for a living. Uh, but next to him was a family named Green, and uh, uh, Mr. Green was the, he was about 60 years old, but he was the shoeshine boy. Uh, he would carry a shoeshine apparatus around to the, to the barber shops and to other things and shine shoes of, of customers and clientele. Uh, and then there was a Bob and Margie Lewis. Uh, Margie was a hairstylist for, for the 
other black families, and Bob had a truck, uh, and he would deliver and do whatever a truck has to do. Uh, and then next to them were the, uh, the Pitt family. Uh, Adele Pitts, uh, you may have known, how many of you have heard of Adele Pitts or knew of her? Uh, Adele, Adele was, thank you, Adele was a, um, uh, a house cleaner, uh, and she had four kids. Uh, the oldest was, was uh, uh, Esther Rankin. I guess there had been a previous marriage or something because it's a different last name. Esther Rankin, whose birth certificate said her name was Queen Esther Rankin, and she was regal and beautiful, and everybody that I knew uh, fell in love with her. My son, Stephen, who was 18 or 19 at the time, was just ape over her, and uh, his father wasn't far behind. Uh, <laughs> and there was a businessman in Laguna that wanted to buy uh, uh, Esther a, a house in, in, in Hawaii and, uh, and set it up there, and then he could visit her on weekends, and she politely demurred. Uh, the, uh, 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 the second in that family was Eli Pitts, and some of you may know Eli now. He's still living in, in Laguna. He lives in uh, Meadowlark, I guess, uh, up in uh, Bluebird Canyon, uh, in Bluebird Knolls. Uh, and uh, he, he got himself a, this is a great family. He got himself a, a degree in, in Stanford, and then he became a PhD with a, a, a degree in, in Stanford International Law. And, uh, and he still is an international law consultant. Uh, he speaks sometimes at the uh, Universal, at uh, the UT Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. And then after him came John Pitts, arguably the best athlete this town has ever had. Uh, uh, John was 6'5", 210, uh, and he played uh, on the basketball team, was the leading scorer in, in, in the county at that time. He, he ran uh, the 100 under, nine, under 10 seconds. He, was, he played two ways on, on, the, on the football field. He was an, a, a wide receiver and a linebacker, uh, offense and defense. And when he finished college, uh, he was the first round draft choice of the Buffalo Bills where he played in the NFL for 10 years. Uh, and when he came out, he bought a bank in Scottsdale. So he, he did well and he, and he bought a house for, for Adele, who continued to be, by the way, all this time a house cleaner. Anyway, so that, that's that family and, and we loved them. They were, they they were just terrific. Uh, one, one day, we got uh, uh, Esther to speak to the Board of Realtors to see about getting jobs. Uh, pretty soon, we were going to start to lose these families. We knew it. And uh, she spoke to the Board of Realtors. And, I, and when she finished, Milne, what was Milne's first name? Anyway, uh, the realtor. Uh, uh, Lloyd, thank you very much. That's why I keep her. Uh, the, uh, uh, he came up to me and he said, boy, he, after she finished, I, I'd hire her in a minute. I said, what, as a receptionist or as an agent? Oh, no, he said, to clean out the place at night. Uh, that's, that's the way they were treated. And gradually the blacks left Laguna, and that is a loss. And I think somebody should make those, those cottages on Ocean Avenue in a stark district because of the history of it, uh, this, this black history that existed because of them. Anyway, so that, that was... That was something that happened in some time between 1958 and 1962, because I remember writing about it in, in, in a column I was writing for the Laguna Beach Post during those years. Yes, Ginger. Why did they leave? They couldn't get jobs and they couldn't live elsewhere. They wanted to be able to be free to live in other parts of town, uh, have a house instead of a, a what people thought of as a, a shack. Uh, uh, those cottages were terrific. They kept them and they were very nice. But uh, they had families, so four kids, uh, Adele and four kids living in a, oh, I don't know, 800 square feet. I, I, I don't know how big those cottages were or are. Uh, they, they, they couldn't. You know about restrictive covenants uh, that existed in, in California and probably other places too, where in, if you owned a house, you, you had your, your deed had a paragraph in it that said you couldn't uh, rent or sell the premises to blacks, Jews, Latinos, uh, you know, the whole line of the people of Asian origin and so on. It, it, was, it was disgusting. Uh, and uh, it took a while before the California S Supreme Court changed that, but that existed back then. So th this, was, this was not a happy place for them. Uh, Laguna was beautiful, and, and they lived here, but it was not happy. A big development in Orange County shortly after you, you moved here was uh, Rossmore uh, Leisure World. 
And uh, I understand there were, they had a, a billboard in Laguna Canyon. One, one day when I was driving up to L.A. to do the story someplace, either a piece for Sport Magazine or for TV Guide or something, uh, when I reached the corner of El Toro Road and, and Laguna Canyon Road, there was suddenly this huge billboard. I had never seen a billboard in Laguna Beach and certainly not in the canyon. Uh, it was one of these 40-footers uh, this way and about 10 feet or more deep, and it was two-sided, and it, it talked about, excuse me, fella, it, it, it talked about the, uh, uh, the apartments and the condos and the houses that are going to be in a, in a senior uh, community uh, called Leisure World, and it was signed Ross Cortese. So it, it was overbearing. It was terrible. It was, it was something I had not experienced. I thought that then of Laguna as small, modest, uh, the, you know, cottages of 800 square feet. Uh, and this was about that same time as the, as the uh, black enclave uh, situation. Uh, so, so I continued on my way, and when I came back that evening, uh, the, the billboard facing me now had the same message, but it also had four lights, uh, lights at each of the corners, uh, and they looked like one-eyed uh, headlights of a, of a car. And so uh, when I, that next morning I called uh, uh, Helen Keeley, who was on the uh, uh, city council, the first woman uh, elected to the city council, but she didn't become mayor because the four boys, I guess, couldn't handle that. Uh, uh, anyway, she, uh, uh, she, I told her about it, and she said she'd look into it. And the afternoon, that afternoon, she called me and said, there's nothing we can do about it. It's not in Laguna. It's in the, the county. And in fact, it's in a funny a, a zone. Of, uh, zone for cemeteries. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess the leisure world was just one step. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> any, anyway, uh, uh, so, so I, I, I said, I, you know, I don't think it's safe. It was those, those cars coming at you when, you, when you're coming home, it, 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 was un, it was dangerous. She said, well, I don't know what we can do about it. So I, I wrote a column. I was doing this column for Bud Desenberg, $5 a week uh, at the Laguna Beach Post. I had to do it under a pseudonym because he was afraid that I was already a, a communist or something. <laughs> uh, and and uh, it was, I called it Hello There uh, by Woody Cove. And I did that column for four years, and it, it won awards every year from the Orange County uh, Press Club. Anyway, uh, so I, I wrote a column about it, uh, and I mentioned the, the fact that I thought it was unsafe. The next day, the billboard came down. The, next, the day after the, the, the column uh, appeared in the paper, the billboard came down. And I thought, whoops, uh, gee whiz, I have a voice. I, I didn't realize that. And that, I think, was the first inkling that I might be able to do something environmentally, because uh, that was an environmental problem. Anyway, there. Of course, uh, 1960, after eight years of uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, Richard Nixon, and John F. Kennedy uh, uh, were the candidates for president of the United States. And um, uh, how did you participate in that? Uh, I, got, I, I wangled from a magazine in New York press credentials to go to the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles. It was in, the, the Democratic Convention was held in Los Angeles that, that year. 
Uh, Bonnie uh, was a golden girl at the convention. The golden girls were the official escorts of the different delegations. Bonnie had the Maryland delegation. Uh, let me say something about uh, the Maryland delegation. It was run by the Attorney General of Maryland. This, is, this was the way democratic politics were back then. Uh, you may notice some, com some similarities. Uh, that uh, He was the Attorney General of Maryland, and then he became Governor of Maryland, and then he became a convict. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that, that, that's the way it was. Well, anyway, Bonnie had that delegation, uh, and she was, she was a golden girl. I think Laguna sent Bonnie and maybe Joyce Duesenberry, I think, was a golden girl, too. Bonnie was a whole generation younger than any of the others, so she was truly a golden girl. Um, uh, this is 1960. Bonnie was mm, in her 30s. She she was probably the the best looking, sexiest woman in California when when she when she when she had uh, uh, that 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 job as, as a golden girl. She was truly a golden girl. Anyway, uh, I was there standing when uh, when Kennedy and Johnson had their uh, debate be before the Massachusetts and the Texas delegations. I was five feet away. There were very it's funny, the press didn't seem interested very much in anything like that. I, I don't know what they were looking for, but they weren't looking for, for things of that nature. And uh, when he got, when Kennedy was nominated one night, the next morning I went up to the sports arena and I knocked on his office. There was nobody outside the office, nobody to stop me. Uh, and I knocked on his door and uh, he said, come in. And I walked in and he said, oh, the press has arrived. And I, I sat with him for 20, 25 minutes of uh, uh, talking. And uh, he wrote a little thing down on a piece of paper. I think he wanted to remember my name or do something. You were uh, talking to Senator Kennedy. Kennedy, yeah. yeah. Did, did I not mention no, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, yeah, Kennedy. John, John F. Kennedy. The nominee. Uh, the nominee. He had won the nomination. Uh, and uh, that week, a week after the convention, I got a call from, from Washington, from the Kennedy headquarters, appointing me to be a, a member of the um, National Speech Writing Committee for the campaign of 1960. Uh, that, that, that's a line on a resume that has nothing to do with fact. Uh, uh, Ted Sorensen wrote all the, all the speeches. Those that he didn't write, Kennedy wrote. Uh, and uh, 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 we who were, maybe there were a hundred of us scattered all over the country, we submitted material. We, we would do research and send material. And once in a while, I think maybe once, I heard a phrase that sounded like something that might have appeared in a sentence that I had written. So and that, was about, that was about as far as it got to being a, a, a speechwriter, but that's what we were called. Anyway. Uh, you did better with uh, Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, didn't you? This was regarding a uh, Disney company yeah. trying to build a big uh, ski uh, resort, Mineral King. Yeah, does anybody know about Mineral King? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. It, it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely gorgeous snow basin up there. It, it's, you can reach it by, by train, car, uh, and then, and then uh, sn snow, snow cars, whatever you call those things, snow, thank you, and, uh, and then uh, uh, on foot. Uh, otherwise, you do not get there. And so, Kennedy, uh, so the Disney company was going to make a big change in that. They were going to have a parking lot for 2,000 cars. They were going to have two restaurants, a chapel, and wonderful ski lifts. And it would be all it would be, it would be immaculate and it would be run very well. And, and, uh, and it sounded all wrong. And I, I, the New York Times asked me to do a piece on it, and I did a piece on it. And uh, about a month after it appeared, uh, I got a call from Bill Wilcox, a lawyer in Laguna Beach. And he said, did I ever write anything about Mineral King? I said, yes, I wrote a piece for the New York Times uh, magazine. He said, you're in a Supreme Court decision. And wow, uh, uh, William O. Douglas had, had written that he had never been to Mineral King, but he'd read about it, and notably, hey, no comma, name of the article, New York Times, so on. And he quoted from it rather liberally, and, and I thought that's the only way he could quote. Uh, uh, the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the um, I, I thought it was I thought that was uh, about as as good as it gets. Uh, in fact, that night I went to a board a, a board meeting of the school board, and I and the who I, I forget who it was who was the president of the school board, but he was a drunk, and he was he was in his in his in his he was yeah anyway. Uh, I said something at the meeting and he insulted me, and I thought, gee, I've I've been cited by the United States Supreme Court and insulted by whatever his name was, I said, I wonder which was the better achievement. Uh, anyway, so, so yeah, that, that, was, that was pretty good. I enjoyed that. You got more? 
I'm, I've got uh, I've got more. Uh, the next topic I'd like to explore is the Main Beach Park, uh, the Laguna Beach uh, window to the sea. Of course, going back uh, to the city's incorporation in 1927, there was the dream of uh, making that uh, a public park. Um, what's your involvement? Okay, uh, I think you've got to go back to to an election in 1968 when when we elected to the council. Uh, we didn't, because I certainly didn't, but, but the city did. Uh, Richard Goldberg, who was the, pre the president of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, Pete Ostranda, who was a very sweet, very good-looking, slightly dim uh, architect, and, and Ed Law, who was, who was right of the, uh, of the Birch Society. Uh, today he would, he would make the, the Tea Party look, look radical, uh, uh, or look centristly radical. Uh, anyway, uh, he, and he, he was a, a, he had a hairstylist, a beauty salon on, on Forest Avenue, and he didn't even have the good taste to be gay. I mean, <laughs> uh, anyway, so, so, so they, they were, they were, that was the, the majority. And then Roy Holm and Charlie Boyd, uh, who, by the way, both were Republicans back then. People don't know that, that don't seem to know that. The, the Boyd family se seems to uh, reject the, the notion that Charlie was ever a, a, uh, a Republican, but he was. Anyway, I, I, think, I think people came to Laguna and they did this, and they felt the air, yeah, and they said, oh, yeah, Republican, three to one, yeah. That, so uh, uh, they, they would then change. Uh, Steve Dicteroy did that. Uh, he came out a, 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 a Democrat from Brooklyn, and uh, his family always a, a, a Democrat, and he came out here, and he became quickly a Republican. Uh, it, it's, it's politically wise, apparently. Anyway, uh, so now where was I? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the purchase uh, the, of uh, the yeah, land for Main the, Beach yeah, Park well, the, and the city council yeah, yes, newly right. elected in 68. Yes, right. Uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> Dick, Dick, Dick Goldberg, who was a very nice guy, by the way, uh, and uh, he ran the best meetings of any, of any, main, any mayor I've seen uh, since that time. Uh, that lectern there, which is used today for, for uh, public communications and for you can have input on certain issues. Uh, it was there all the time for anybody in the audience to be used at any time during a meeting. Uh, if something came up and, and Bonnie wanted to say something, she'd walk over there and the mayor would say, yes, Mrs. Haino, and, and, or, or maybe yes, Bonnie, uh, and, and she could then just say what you want, and there was no time limit. Uh, today we have time limits and we have these other things which are not as good as it used to be back then. Anyway, uh, Dick uh, decided that it would be a good idea to have a, a string of high-rise hotels going from Broadway to Bluebird Canyon, about a mile and an eighth of high-rise hotels. Uh, and we had already seen one high-rise hotel uh, uh, come along, and that was the Surf and Sand. It was built in a, in a zone that allowed uh, hotels to be 35 feet tall, and uh, Merrill Johnson, also a very nice guy, the owner of the, of the Surf and Sand, managed to get a 23-foot variance. Variances were given out like, like I don't know, uh, popcorn at, at, at ball games. You, you, you could get a variance for almost anything at any time and, 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 and at any length. So a, a hotel that was going to be 100 feet tall, 10 stories high, which was Goldberg's original zone idea, could be 200 feet, 300 feet, 1,000 feet. It could, have been any, it could have been anything with the lax variance that we had in, in operation. And then, and this offended a few of us. I, I mentioned that uh, uh, this is history made by one person. It, it, it's a lie. History is made by, by committees often and, and, and very well made by committees. Uh, we, we formed a, a, a committee to, to fight this thing. Uh, Roger McElain built a a, um, a mock-up of what the city would look like from uh, Broadway to Bluebird with these 100-foot-tall hotels uh, just overshadowing uh, uh, the small bungalows and cottages of Laguna. And, uh, and so we, uh, uh, we decided we would fight this. And, but if you just fought the high-rise of it, you'd fight, you could beat it, but then the high-rise could pop up elsewhere. So we decided we would go whole hog and, and make it a forever thing by by uh, initiating a, an ordinance that would uh, uh, create a, a, 
a height limit for the entire city, the entire city. So there could, there could be no high rise anywhere, anytime after that. The only way you can undo a, an initiative, by the way, is through another initiative. And so uh, though there's been some objections through the law, through the courts of our initiative, uh, it's held up. And, and the only way you can do it is to pass another initiative. And it's become uh, 36 feet and three stories have, have become a, a motherhood in Laguna. And so that's 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 the way it is. We 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 uh, when we when we showed that mock up to the planning commission, which was going to be hearing the the zone idea, uh, and we whisked the sheet off the 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 mock up. Uh, a planning commissioner said to me later, "When you guys did that, that was the end of that zone. We knew there there would be no such zone in Laguna." And uh, so we we uh, we started the petition drive. Uh, 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 Phyllis Sweeney, dear Phyllis, was in charge of the grocery stores. Uh, uh, we started on a Friday night gathering names, and we had a meeting on Sunday. I think it was at the Women's Club, but I'm not sure. And I chaired that meeting, and F Phyllis was in the back row getting reports from the, from the grocery store, the, the petition gatherers, uh, name, signature gatherers. And we'd hoped to get two or 300 names that first weekend so we could get a good start. And she sent up a piece of paper. I still have it someplace in my, if I ever find it in my messy zen, messy, messy den, uh, zen also. The, uh, uh, she sent up this little piece of paper, excuse me, Guy, you're doing this again. Uh, and it said 1016, 1016 names in that one weekend, which was just about all the names we needed for the entire uh, uh, period of, of collecting names. We, we collected for a month and we collected close to 4,000 names, which was about half the registered voters in Laguna Beach. And we, everybody signed the damn thing. I mean, uh, Art Dusenberry uh, was, a, was a member of Village Laguna and also, or a member of our group and also a member of the Taxpayers Association. And he got some of the Jarvis's to sign it. He got, he got people, he got others to sign. Everybody signed that thing. Everybody that, that could read or write signed that petition. And, we, and the election was, was uh, we won by three to one. We carried every precinct, and it, it, was, it was easy. The, um, this term, window to the sea, was uh, plagiarized. Uh, uh, we, we called the streets off Coast Highway that led down to the, uh, to the coast uh, our windows to the sea, because the, and they were going to be blocked by these hotels. And that was one of our arguing points. And then so this, this window to the sea uh, you know, became uh, that's what this, the city did. Uh, uh, you couldn't have had a, a, a park there because there was going to be a 100-foot-tall hotel there. And so what we did was we made it possible for there to be a park, a central park in, in Laguna Beach, a, a, a main beach park. So that was, that was, that was pretty good. Uh, and, and that also was the beginning of, uh, really the beginning of Village Laguna. We started during the collection of names and, uh, and uh, we've continued to this day. And uh, I was chair of Village Laguna for two, set, two, two terms. and then again two terms in the 1970s and, and uh, 
you know, and Phyllis Sweeney became the first woman mayor of Laguna Beach. And if you think back, Phyllis, Bobby Minkin, who's in the audience, and um, uh, Anne Kristoff, uh, uh, Sally Bellarue, uh, thank you, and, and uh, Tony, and uh, there, there have been some great women, Martha Collison, uh, uh, Kathleen Blackburn, there have been great, great mayors of Laguna Beach who, who, were, who were women. Uh, and I think I played a role in some of that uh, when, when, when Dick Goldberg made an announcement one day at a city council meeting of, of three appointments to, to some board or other, and they were all women. Uh, they were all men, excuse me, uh, three, three, uh, three men to a board. This is before all this had happened. Uh, and I walked up to the lectern, as I, as I described earlier, and Goldberg acknowledged me, and I said, I was sitting back there, and I was counting, and I think I counted 17 appointments that were all uh, men. Wasn't there a, a single woman or a married woman? Wasn't there a single woman that, that you could have appointed uh, to, uh, to one of those things? They were stunned. It had not occurred to them. I mean, that, that's the way things were back then. And uh, uh, Ed Law, in fact, said, he said, you know, he said, as a matter of fact, I'm standing there at this time, and, and this is a colloquy now going on between me and, and the five up here. Uh, and he said, you know, he said, there was a woman I thought of for one of those appointments, but she just left town at that time. I said, where is she now? He said, she's in Arizona. I said, so the only woman capable of filling a job uh, on one of these boards is a woman who now lives in Arizona. And then I walked away from the, from the, from the lecture and sat down. I did not make any phone calls, but the next morning, somebody from the Fair Employment Practices Commission with an office in Santa Ana uh, was in City Hall and, uh, and uh, uh, looking into this thing, and so some of these appointments started to come shortly thereafter. So I think that may be a more, I, I take more pleasure in that, I think, than in the, uh, the high rise. I, I, really, I, really, I really like that. <laughs> If I, uh, if I could, Arnold, uh, let me uh, back up uh, a little bit. The, uh, the, high, uh, the building height limit election was in August of 1971. Mm -hmm. In the prior year of 1970, there was uh, uh, some kind of activity that actually uh, uh, may have uh, helped. And as I understand it, it was the dogs on the beach protest. Oh, yes, for sure. Uh, uh, is, that, is that possibly true? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it's easily true. Th thank you. Uh, 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 Richard Chalice, who spoke before this group uh, uh, some, some months ago, uh, uh, headed a group when, when, when Ed Law decided that he didn't like uh, hippies and he, and, and he wanted to drive them out of town. One of the things that he thought of brilliantly was if he could get rid of the dogs that hippies had, the hippies would then follow the dogs. And... <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, uh, he didn't realize that there were other people in town besides hippies who had dogs. <laughs> and so, so, so uh, the, 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 the council passed the, the, the law, uh, this emergency ordinance, that to ban dogs on all beaches, all parks, on leash, off leash, just ban all dogs. And we had six parks in Laguna at that time. And so uh, Richard Chalice started a group of, of dog owners. Uh, Bonnie and I were part of that. Uh, and we had parades of opposition. I, 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 my favorite uh, sign, the one that I made up, the one that I liked best in that was that uh, uh, God is dog spelled backwards. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe dog is God spelled backwards, I don't remember. It's one or the other. Anyway, anyway, um, uh, we once again were collecting names, but Dick Chalice didn't know about California law. And we, we would get names on, on scraps of paper and, and present them to the council, and they would thank us and throw them away. And, and uh, uh, so I, I went to the library, and I learned about recall, referendum, and initiative. Those are the three words that I remember from my civics classes back east. Uh, and I didn't know which one was which and how to use them, but I learned how to use them by reading in, in, in the library. And this, was, this called for a referendum. You could, stop a referend you could stop a law by a referendum if you could file it within 30 days of the passage of the law. And so we had a hurry to do that, and we did that, and we collected a bunch of names, and we brought those names to the, to the council and presented them very legally, and they sat here, and they, uh, they didn't throw those away. Uh, 
but the, but the argument raged in, uh, at, that, at that meeting. And I wasn't sure that we could win that election. I was sure we could win the high-rise election. I knew we'd win the high-rise election. I was not sure about the, the dogs, because uh, there were a lot of people, Bruce Hopping, uh, who thought the dogs were, 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 were going to pass on all sorts of diseases to everybody. Uh, Bruce is here, I think. Uh, and, uh, and other people who, did, who just thought dogs were messy. And a realtor, uh, Vern Tashner, used to go to the beach, put up his umbrella, and, uh, and sit there and take a nap. And I don't know why it was, but dogs would immediately be attracted to him and, 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 and urinate on him. <laughs> yes, uh, anyway, uh, so, 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 so for some reason, he didn't want dogs on the beach <laughs> as a result. But any, anyway, uh, 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 Dick Goldberg was running this meeting, and Dick, Dick, by the way, had stomach ulcers, and he would take pills, and every so often he would froth. <laughs> I'm a poor guy. I mean, I liked him. He he hated me, but I liked him. Uh, anyway, he uh, he was he was going on about this, and I I wrote a little note and and said, call a 10 minute recess. And so he was saying something, I, and then he saw this thing, I call a 10-minute recess. So I went up there and I spoke to Pete Ostrander, the, the, the dim architect. I, sa I, said, I said, Pete, do you think if we um, would just allow dogs on half the, in the half the parks and, and on the beaches early morning and late evening, uh, that would fly? And he said, I think so. And so that's the way it ended up. Uh, Ed Van Dusen was very angry with me. He, he called me all sorts of names because he thought I had I'd sold out, and to a degree I had. Uh, but uh, a few days later, he cooled off and, and, and said, no, I, I guess you were right, because nobody knew how that election would have turned out. Anyway, so, so that was that, from that group, we were able to then move that, that, that thinking and, and that, uh, the orderly process of getting names in, in a legal manner uh, to the, um, the high-rise fight. Um, you've mentioned uh, Councilman, Councilman Ed Lohr a number of times. W was there an effort to recall him? There was a successful effort to recall him. He was, the, I think, the only city council member who's ever been recalled. Uh, he, he, had, he had taken his wife on a, on a junket to Hawaii on, on, the, on the city uh, money. Now, now that's, what all, that's what all politicians do. But, uh, but anyway, he, he did it, and, and, uh, and that gave us a little hand on him, because it was, he, was, he was very difficult to, to control, and this, this gave us a little handle. Uh, and also, uh, when, he, when he wanted to get rid of the hippies and, and the dog thing sort of backfired on him, he wanted to dynamite the caves in which hi hippies would live, not, not while they were in the caves, but that's where they slept at night, and he wanted to get rid of those, those things. And, that, that offended a, a few uh, archaeologists in, in town and so on. Anyway, uh, so, so, so we decided at a certain point it was time to recall him. Uh, and we, he also hated the green belt. Uh, he thought that was a, a Looney, Tune, Looney Tunes idea. And I have to make a confession. I thought it was a Looney Tunes idea, too. Uh, I, th I think Jim Dilley w was, was the person of, of history who, who, who did things without committee and... and I, I was all for his doing it, but I didn't think it was possible he could do it. It just seemed insane to me. I, I'm going to ask the, the, the people at, uh, at the Irvine Company to give me some land and, and other, just give it to me or sell it to me cheap. He did. He succeeded anyway. So that, that's, that's, that's over here someplace. Uh, so where, where was I? Uh, Ed Lord. We're, we're trying Ed to Lord, recall Ed Lord. We're, we're to, I'm, try, I'm trying to recall my, my memory. Uh, <laughs> the... Uh, uh, so, so we, we, we put out, we did a petition to recall Ed Law, and I remember walking up to one street, and there was a guy out, out there watering his lawn, and he said, what is it you got there? I said, a, a petition to recall Ed Law. He said, why? I said, well, he, he took his wife on this, this junket to Hawaii uh, on the city, and, and, he doesn't, he, and he said, well, all politicians do that, and he, uh, he doesn't think, he doesn't like the green belt, and... And he said, well, who does? And, and, and I, I said, and he traps cats on his lawn. And he did. And, and the guys grabbed the thing, and he signed in a hurry. And he, he, was so, he was so offended by this thought, and he was offended at me for mentioning And he said, like, get out of here. And, and, but, but, but that's why we recalled him. We recalled him because Ed Law 
didn't like cats, and when they trespass onto his lawn, he had a, 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 tr a thing they, that, that, with food in it, they were going to it, and he would, get cap he would capture the cats, and then he would do something with them, get rid of them someplace. Anyway, so, so we, we, we called him. And, and do you recall what year that was? Well, he was elected in 68, and, this, and he didn't, he didn't he make didn't. it to 72, <laughs> so, so sometime in there. Uh, as you may know, uh, uh, Foster Eubank and I are working on a book, Then and Now, uh, and uh, so he's been running around taking current photographs of, uh, uh, to match up with many historic uh, photographs, and uh, there are lots of things that are uh, little changed over the years. Uh, you mentioned the founding of uh, Village Laguna in 1971. And, uh, uh, the, you know, the goal there is to preserve and promote the uh, village atmosphere. Uh, do you have anything more to tell us about the founding of Village Laguna and its impact? Uh, I think its impact is, is, is splendid and, and, and is ongoing. And uh, the thing that worries me about Village Laguna, as it worried me last night at, at, the, at the LCC, uh, when uh, Chris, Chris uh, uh, Quilter spoke about the fact he doesn't really think it's that he wants to be president of that group until the end of his life. Uh, where He wanted to know where are the people coming up to replace the old guards. And I think Village Laguna is a wonderful organization showing its, 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 uh, its uh, age. Uh, we, we have done lots of wonderful things, and we will continue to do wonderful things. But who in the hell are going to replace us? And, and is it, how many people in this audience are under 50 years old? There's, 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 the, there's the answer. Representing the youth of America. So between 21 and 35, yes. Between 35 and 50, yeah, that's what we want them. We want them, we want them. And they don't want us. Uh, it, it's, we have created generations after generations of, of people who were brought up watching television. And, and now doing something called Twitter and doing something called Tweak and, and, and Facebook and I something or other, none of which do I understand or know or own. I don't even own a cell phone. Uh, and I have trouble enough with a dial phone. I mean, I still like being able to the phone and having the operator say, what number do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, a anyway, uh, uh, starting, starting Village Laguna was easy. Uh, it, ca it came out of the, the, um, the fight against High Rise. Uh, everybody loved us. The village atmosphere became a motto, and we could win an election just by saying village atmosphere. Uh, I, I remember when, when Carl, see John, Carl Johnson was running for, for, for council, and I wrote an ad called, uh, that said, whose town is it anyway? And, and things like that, 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 that's stupid. I mean, to say something like that is stupid. Uh, I remember once saying at a meeting, uh, I, I'm, I'm for, for parks, not parking lots, and Roger McLean was wise enough to say, where are you going to put the cars? And, uh, uh, you know, so those things that I, I said and did were stupid things. But they sold, and, and, and we, we sold Village Atmosphere, and we sold uh, Windows to the Sea, and we sold the, the Main Beach Park, and it became... Uh, easy to win elections until everybody else learned the language, and and th then they all everybody became an environmentalist, and they all wanted a, a, a village atmosphere, and so it, we uh, we we no longer win a, a, all the elections. Now it's a, like a fifty-fifty bet whether we we'll win an election. Anyway, so so uh, it's a, it, it, village Laguna is is a great organization. There are other great organizations in this town. Uh, the County Conservancy is great, Greenbelt is great, uh, and I think that the people who care most about Laguna uh, are on our side. Uh, but then that's kind of snobbish of me, so I, I don't know. I, I have a dear friend. He, 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 is, he opposes everything I stand for. And, and, and that, that, that's uh, Dave Connell. Uh, uh, Dave did, did a favor to me when I was trying to get some some help from the VA about uh, my broken back and a few other things, and he, he helped me through that. And he doesn't believe in any of the, the, the stuff I've talked about tonight. Uh, I, have, I have another friend, my, my dear friend Jeff Jameson, who is here. 
he 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 is he is probably The man I, I love most in the world, and and uh, uh, he and I just don't 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 talk politics. Uh, you know, we we know not to. Uh, anyway, so so Phyllis Laguna, uh, where are the young people who will, who will replace uh, all of us who are going to die off? That's 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 the question, and uh, I don't I don't see them coming up, and I don't know what the solution is. Well, uh, I have to rule that out of order. This is a historical society program. <laughs> And that is an issue that, uh, well, anyway. Um, talking about Main Beach Park. I, I'm always out of order. Yes, <laughs> so out of order, out of that's order. That's not news. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the Main Beach Park property, that's 1,000 feet of open space, was purchased in 1968. And, of course, it had restaurants and uh, 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 gas stations and stuff mm -hmm. on it. And they were allowed uh, to continue to be in business for about five years. And then finally, in 1974, there was uh, uh, the the uh, the land was cleared, and uh, then there was the opening of the uh, of the park in uh, Main Beach Park in 1974. Yes. What well, about it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and and uh, and Roy Holm jumped out of a plane and landed on on the on the sands that day, uh, uh, parachuting down from a plane that was piloted by a, an astronaut. Scott Carpenter. No, no, was, I believe it was either Grissom or I forget, it was not Scott Carpenter. Anyway, okay. uh, anyway, uh, it, and I was, I was one of six or seven people invited who had not been part of, of, of the building of the park, the making of the park, the politics of the park. Jim Dilley was also w one of those six or seven people. So uh, I said to Bill Wilcoxon, who was one of the leaders, I said, why am I invited? He said, because of the high rise fight, if you had not done that, we would, have had, we would have a hotel here and we would not have the park here. So, as I said that earlier, uh, I should have had somebody sitting here. Uh, when I teach school, when I taught school at USC and other places, I would um, always ask a student if, if he or she would, would do me one favor, I, I will give you an automatic A if you sit here at my left knee and say, you said that already. <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, so, so you, know, I, you can tell I was an easy grader. Uh, so, so, so what else? Um, what's the history of design review in uh, the city of Laguna Beach? I understand that you served on the first design review board. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I, I got a phone call from Roy Holm one morning and saying, uh, uh, congratulations, you've been appointed to the Board of Adjustment. I said, what's that? And, uh, uh, it turned out that the night before the city council meeting, uh, the three people who have been doing this work, for some reason they all quit, three men, and, uh, and Goldberg called a, uh, in a secret, secret session or closed session uh, and asked for, for three appointments, for, to fill these three appointments. And uh, Ed Law uh, suggested Milt Hansen, who was a realtor, very funny guy, liked him very much, and uh, uh, Pete Ostrander uh, 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 suggested Chris Abel, who was really a terrific person, suffering from a terrible, painful uh, uh, 
osteopainful stuff. He was crippled. Uh, he ended up with operations in, uh, in uh, uh, Scandinavia someplace or other. And, and, uh, and uh, Roy Holmes suggested me, at, w at which point, at law, I understand, hit the ceiling with, with his head. Uh, but if Goldberg said, we have three appointments, we have three names, case closed. And so that's how I got appointed to the Board of Adjustment, which heard variances, uh, my favorite subject, and, uh, and then became morph it morphed into being the first uh, design review board in Orange County. It was here in Laguna Beach. The three of us, and then we picked up two more people, Lou Murphyne and uh, I think Peter Weisbrot, I'm not sure. Anyway, then uh, the five of us, and uh, I served from 71 to 73, uh, and quit then for family problems. Our, our daughter was not well. So anyway, uh, you want to talk about, uh, shall I talk about the two buildings that we saved? Uh, yes, uh, let me give a little background on that. Of course, uh, Wells Fargo Bank is down the street next to the Murphy Smith uh, bungalow at uh, 260 Ocean Avenue. Uh, that was that building was built in 1961 uh, by the um, uh, Ar 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 Aubrey St. Clair was the architect in what Verity? What's Verity's first name? W Wilfred Ver Verity and um, is that Jane Jans who's who supplying? Yes, that? indeed. Yes, uh, so let's hear it for Jane Jans. I love her. And the, uh, the builder was uh, David Young, who served so many years on the Fe Festival of the Arts Board. Uh, so that was Laguna Federal Savings. They uh, moved uh, just uh, from down the street, uh, which was uh, uh, where Sirius and Sons, uh, the, the rug store currently is. And uh, so it was, was it previously the, uh, the Offenkamp uh, Lynn Theater? Yeah. And... Um, so uh, if you go to the Wells Fargo Bank uh, today, uh, you'll know they have a huge parking lot, particularly on the Broadway side. But uh, on the Broadway side, uh, there were uh, two fairly large buildings, a French chateau and uh, what is this? Uh, Casa, Casa de Mandigo. Mandingo. Mandingo. And um, so uh, if you Mandingo. notice, the buildings aren't there, and the bank's got a big parking lot. What happened, Arnold? Uh -huh. And this uh, is in the 70s, right? This, 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 is, this, is, this, is, this is also in the 71 to 73 period, because uh, it, uh, it was the last day that I was on the, on the committee, 73, that, that we, we decided what to do. What, what I wanted to do was to save those two buildings. The, the uh, Laguna Fed Savings and Loan had gotten a, a permit to demolish the buildings. Uh, one was the, the Chateau-style building, was the Barbara Weber Dance Studio, and the other building, uh, the Casa de Mondigo had two stories of, of, of apartments, seven apartments on one floor, seven apartments on the second floor, and they were going to demolish those buildings. Uh, they, they were, it, it's always this way. When, they, when you have to demolish a building, first you prove to, to, to the world that, that it's termite-ridden and, 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 and it's falling apart and, and all those other things. Anyway, I asked Bruce Shearer, who was a friend of mine, a builder, uh, whether he would go through the buildings with me and... Uh, uh, now, for Bruce to crawl through those, Bruce is six feet eight, and he crawled through those buildings with me, marveling at how well they were built. We found not a single termite, and, and, and it was, it was, it was a, two healthy buildings that were going to be destroyed. And so I, I suggested to our design review board, since there was no such thing as the historic, uh, the heritage committee in town, there was no such thing as, as an, an inventory of, of uh, historic buildings in town, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we, 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 should, we should take that role. And, and so we declared the two buildings historic. Uh, on the basis of what? On the basis of because I wanted to save those buildings. And, and so, so uh, and since it was going to be my last day on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the committee, uh, they, they acceded to that. So, so we declared them, uh, uh, we declared them historic, historic buildings. But that didn't, that didn't deny the, the right of of the savings and loan people to, to, to demolish them because they had that, the permit already. It's easier to get a, a permit to demolish than you, than you can to build, and that's something screwed up right there. Anyway, uh, it, we took it, somehow we got it, we got it uh, appealed to the Coastal Commission, which was very new, too, in those days. 
And I went up there with Mary Miller. Do people remember Mary Miller? Uh, she's left town recently, Mary and Max. Ni ni nice woman, bright. And we, we drove together to the Coastal Commission and uh, to, to make this appeal. We had already filed an appeal. And when we got there, uh, we were told that it was really a useless uh, venture because the, the staff had already decided against us. And so, so, so I, I had five minutes. And so they gave me five minutes and I told them that, that uh, all the things I just told you and boiled down to uh, the, these, these are buildings worth saving. And, and so they agreed to override their staff the, the recommendation and, and they said, do what you can to keep to save the buildings by, by can you move them? I said, I don't know, but we'll try. Uh, so when I got back to, to Laguna and I looked in the yellow pages to find who, who moved buildings. I, I knew nothing about this. And I, the, the first one was like an ABC, you know, uh, uh, builders or movers. And so I called them and told them about the two buildings and how big they were and, and what they were like and so on. And um, they said, um, you know, the guy on the, on the other end said, yeah, we can do that. I said, what will that cost? He said, oh, about 5000 to move each building. And uh, meanwhile, I, I had found two uh, realtors, uh, uh, Rick Balza and Mark Gumbiner. Uh, and they bought the buildings from, from, uh, from the Laguna Federal Savings Loan for a dollar each. Uh, so they had, the, they had these buildings, and, and I had a mover, and, and, and at dawn one weekend, uh, they moved one building, and the next dawn, the, the next weekend, they moved the other building, and today, that, uh, one, the, the, the Barbara Weber studio had to be cut in half to be moved. So they cut it in half, they moved it in two pieces, and they pasted it back together, and uh, uh, Rick Balls had complained that it took a, cost him about $100,000 to have the, all the redoing of it. But he sold the thing for half a million about four or five years later. Uh, it, it's now the orthodontia building at uh, 11 something hundred. Uh, 1166 Glenary. Uh, yeah, between um, uh, Oak and, and Brooks. Uh, it's, I, think, I think it's the handsomest a commercial building in Laguna outside of the downtown. The Eschbach building is the handsomest commercial building in Laguna. But outside of the, the downtown, I think that's the best looking building. And the other building uh, uh, was moved to, to, to uh, uh, Coast Highway. Se 1750 South Coast Highway. And you know what that is? It's the, tie, it's the Royal Tie. And, and, and that, that was Mark Gumbiner hired Chris Abel to redo the building inside, and and it's a, uh, you know, it's probably that's probably worth what four million dollars sitting there. It is uh, uh, current real estate market. We don't use the word worth anymore. Okay, uh, no. Okay, you. It might sell for four million. <laughs> it might not. Okay, well, so, so, so it's 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 a little more than one one buck anyway. It's, it, the, 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 they bought it for a buck and they moved it for you know another hundred thousand and and anyway. So so I, I get the. I like that, that, that whole thing because people think of environmentalists as being uh, fuzzy-headed and woolly and, and uh, if, uh, you know, no economic uh, uh, grasps at all. But uh, we did that and, and it, it was done and, uh, and those buildings have been saved. I like, I like saving buildings. I, I feel a, an affinity for, for old stuff, old trees, old buildings. Uh, uh, I don't like it when cottages get get moved. I thought the cottages in front of the the of Susie Q should have been saved. Uh, instead of just saving them by moving them, they should have saved them and used them. And and but nobody was going to do that. Uh, about six months ago, I said to Ken Frank, "You know, I really feel bad about the those cottages. They they should have been used." And he said, "Yes, they should have been." So if he didn't say he didn't say that during the time of the discussion. So there, but any, any, did we touch every every base? Because I think uh, we, I think we want to hear from people, don't we? Well, uh, I only have a, a couple of more. Okay. And then uh, what we will do is to ask people to ask questions or make comments. Uh, we'll ask them to come up to the uh, uh, podium there and use the microphone since the uh, uh, since we're recording this. Um, there is a there was a large pine tree, or there is a large pine tree on North Coast Highway between yeah. uh, Chiquita Street and Cliff Drive in North Laguna. Yes. Um, 
You're involved in saving that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, uh, uh, that, that's, that's where, you know, the Midas, the, 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 the thing is, that, that tree is, 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 is still there. Uh, Standard Oil was going to put a gas station there. Maybe they did put a gas station there. And they, they, they had a design uh, that included the demolition or the, or the chopping down of that tree. Now, that tree had been used as a welcoming tree during the Christmas season. It would be tinseled and, 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 and lights, and, and it would welcome people driving south from the Newport area into Laguna Beach. It was the first thing you saw coming into Laguna Beach at that, during the winter season. And so I went to the meeting. It was a meeting of the Planning Commission to hear the design, and the, and the, and the chop, which included the chopping down of the tree. Uh, and it was not held here. Uh, maybe at that time, and I don't know what year we're talking about, 75, somewhere in there maybe, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, may, maybe City Hall, Jane, when, when did City Hall put its second story on? No, that was after we came to town, so that oh. was, uh, that was, uh, was uh, maybe uh, 1990 or so. Oh, okay, all right. So anyway, anyway there was, something was happening in, in City Hall that they could, the Planning Commission could not meet there. They were meeting at the Forum Theater, and so I went to the Forum Theater. There were five or six items on the agenda, and they, um, there may be 10 people in the audience, typical at that time, a, a, a typical small, typical uh, uh, meeting. And it dragged on forever, as meetings do. I see, I, I have another. The theory about meetings, including this meeting, I don't think any meeting, including the UN uh, or the Hague, should last more than an hour. I mean, that's the, the, the idea of a two-hour meeting. Whew. Anyway. Uh, You're welcome uh, to uh, fill out our complaint the, form. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, so so I, I'm sitting there, and, and people are leaving, and by the time the, this thing came up, I was the only, the only person in the audience. Uh, there were a couple of staff people and the five the uh, planning commissioners, and uh, they, they, they were standard oil with suits and ties and, and very pleasant manner, you know, you know, the way they always do it. Uh, they, uh, uh, they said that their arborist uh, had declared that that tree was, uh, it was sick and dying and so on. And, um, and uh, so, I, so when I got up to talk, I said, well, my arborist uh, says that that tree is healthy. And so since we had this, uh, you know, we, neither arborist was in the room. Uh, I don't believe their arborist existed. I know mine didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so that uh, the next morning, uh, so, so the planning commission just decided to not do anything about it yet. They, they liked the design. The design was wonderful, and, and we all approved of it. But, but the tree was a problem. And we'd solve that later. So I called Fred Lang the next morning. And I said, Fred, I said, you, you, you've just been nominated to be my arborist. And, and you've just uh, certified that a tree at the north end of town, blah, 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 is in perfectly good shape. Can you go there and, and confirm that? And so he, he 
he drove out there and he came back and he confirmed it. And he said that tree, he said to me, so that tree can last 20 more years easily. It, it, they, they had said it was going to, their arborist said it was dead and it would be gone in a year. So at least my arborist was closer to the truth because uh, uh, it's still there. And it's, it's, it, is a beautiful, it is a beautiful pine tree. And so, so that, that, was, that was nice. I'm sure we all want to know about the low density report to, to the city council. Oh. Which I've never heard of before. <laughs> uh, the, the city council, as, as, they, as, as they tend to do, uh, uh, parceled out a study to some group someplace or other, I forget their name, and uh, to decide uh, how big Laguna Beach should be. It, how, how big could we grow out to, to what limit? And they hired and paid these people the, what then was probably a, a, a whopping ten or $15,000 to, to, do their, to do their report. And he came back and they said something like population of 35,000 or something like that, which offended uh, the, us humble people who, who believed in modest scale, human uh, the scale, modest dimensions, uh, all, all, that, all that BS that, that we environmentalists use, right. Uh, and so, and so uh, uh, somebody said, maybe I said, but somebody said to, to whoever was mayor then, uh, we can do better than that. And they said, well, if you can, come up with a report. And so we came up with, we, we, we studied it, we came up with a report that we had, uh, we could do all this that we wanted to do through zoning changes and other things and, and have a density at around 18,500. And finally, the, the city council, I think it was the council, not the, not the planning commission, no, it was the planning commission uh, determined that how about, how, how do we feel about 20,000? That sounded fine to us. So they had a, a density limit of, of 20,000 back then. That was before uh, South Laguna was, was, was in Laguna. So that's pretty much about where we are today. And, and, and uh, so we were part of, of doing a low density study that became part of uh, Laguna Beach. Those studies, they, what, what do they do? They, they don't really exist. They, 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 they're, they, they're bought and paid for and then ignored. Uh, uh, the the um, uh, the village entrance, you know, that's not just a few years. I mean, that's like a, a, a couple of dozen years that that's been passing around. And uh, uh, I think we'll probably get another study out of that. I'm pretty sure. I it's think fine. you're right. <laughs> anyway, so so there. Uh, if anybody would like to make a comment or uh, ask a question, uh, this is the podium I was referring to. Please come on up. And uh, there's nothing wrong with the line. Uh, if, you, if you want to follow this, the, the next person. Uh, while we're waiting, let me ask a, a question, because um, uh, the Laguna Greenbelt was uh, founded in 1968, and the, the founder is Jim Dilley. And uh, I, I would think that uh, uh, everybody would always want to be nice to Mr. Dilley. But I understand he wanted to serve on the Laguna Beach Planning Commission. <laughs> yes. uh, what happened there? Well, he didn't live in Laguna Beach. He lived. He lived in Three Arch Bay, and uh, it's pretty clear that that, uh, that you have to live in, in Laguna Beach to serve on the city council and to serve on the main uh, the planning commission and the design review board. By the way, there were some uh, the failures in, in that in that area someplace. Uh, anyway, uh, Jim didn't live there, and I think, bless me, I think I mentioned it, and uh, and he he didn't talk to me for a year. Because he, he I, I, I said it's 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 not, it's not taxation without representation. It's representation without taxation. Because right. uh, he would, he would be out there and, and anyway. So so Jim was not appointed. Jim would have been a marvelous planning commissioner. And we all knew he would have made, been a marvelous planning commissioner. Uh, a little wacky, but he would have been he would have been great. He just didn't live in town. He just didn't live in town. Yeah. Um, when Main Beach Park uh, went in, uh, Fred Lang was in charge of the uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, the all design. the plannings, the design landscaping. It had a lot of varieties of uh, plants and so forth. Uh, but within a few uh, years, most uh, half of them died or something. What's that all about? Uh, you you got me because I'm I'm not a landscaper and I don't know one tree from another. I know a a pine tree from a palm tree, and that's about as far as it goes. Uh, Yes, they did. Uh, I think Fred Lang w w was a genius, uh, and I, I loved his work. He did, he did our house, uh, uh, 
in the top of Bluebird Canyon, did all the landscaping, the design, and trees, and everything for a thousand bucks, and, and that, that it was just great. Uh, and I think he's done a lot of wonderful work, but apparently some of those trees didn't make it. To, but well, the, the the story I remember about who was the, who's the postmaster uh, Don uh, Don Don. Don Rose. Don Rose and uh, and uh, Fred Lang driving around. That's that historic resource inventory which was put together in the early 1980s to identify uh, historic structures and maybe uh, trees. I guess I don't. I, I think they did trees too. Kathy Les was was one of them. Wasn't that, wasn't that one of the people who did that inventory? I, we have people who were just dying to to. to okay, Jim. Please, a question or a comment. Uh, Arnold, I uh, thank you very much for your years of service. And I'd like to know what you'd like to see become of the whole idea of the village entrance. I'd, li I'd like to see a, a, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, uh, I'd like to see a small park. I'd like to see um, uh, some sensible parking, but not oversized parking. And uh, I'd like to Make sure that it's pretty and, and, and there's room to walk and talk and, 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 and that's it. I, I thought that Bob Borthwick's uh, uh, job had been done beautifully well and I thought that that was uh, the, the right way to go and, uh, uh, and that's what we should be doing. I don't know that that's going to happen. Uh, I think Elizabeth is pretty s set firmly on on a huge number of, of parking spaces uh, to be filled. And if that happens, then, then the whole thing's going to fall. It's not going to make it. Uh, thank you very much, Arnold. You've, you've been my hero for a long time. Um, <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> uh, I, I love the story that you told about the barber shop, and uh, that, was, that was beautiful. I'd never heard that before. Uh -huh. um, anyway, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about your sports writing and books, because um, I know that was a big part of your life. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I'd like to go back, can I go back to the barber shop? Uh, 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 Leo Phillips, the, the, the barber who did cut Jim Jones' hair and cut my hair, uh, he had, a, he had a, a thing for the wife of the, one of the business managers downtown, and, and, he, and so he had an affair with, with her, but that was okay with him because he was having an affair with the teller at the bank. So, so, so anyway, uh, uh, and, and Leo, one day the Chamber of Commerce uh, sent a, a bunch of people into his, 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 into his barbershop uh, to have him sign a petition. Now, Leo Phillipson was illiterate, uh, and, and so he, he, he said, what's it all about? And they said, well, it's to keep the Jews from, from uh, buying up property in, in the downtown. And Leo was a little guy, a little terrier of a guy. He threw them out bodily, uh, just, just bounced them. Anyway, my, my, my sporting life. <laughs> uh, I thought that the sixth game of the World Series just passed was maybe the best baseball game, maybe the best sporting event that I've, that I've lived through. And I've lived through an awful lot of them. Don Lawson's perfect game. Uh, I saw Branko Nagurski playing football. I, you know, I, uh, I, I, I saw uh, Muhammad Ali, I, but I thought that that, that sixth game, how many of you saw or, or know anything about it? Do, do, you, do you agree with me? That, that was I, I, I even, at the end of the ninth, or during the ninth inning, I, I left my television perch and walked in and said to Bonnie, you know, I know how you feel about this thing, but I think you should be watching this. It's really incredible. But it, it, she, she, she nodded her head and went back to whatever she was doing, <laughs> of, of, of some worthy nature, of course. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, th th that renewed my faith. In, in, in fact, it was, it was such a good game that the seventh game didn't matter a damn. Uh, it, 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 I, I, I cared. I wanted the Cardinals to win. I was pleased that they won. But the thrill had been sucked out of me uh, by that, 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 that game. That was just a, a great, great, marvelous event. Uh, I've written a lot, of, a lot of sports books. I've written 500, uh, uh, I've written about 100 pieces for Sport Magazine. And uh, uh, I think Sport Magazine was, was 
a better written magazine than Sports Illustrated back then. And uh, with Roger Kahn, with Ed Lynn, with me, with a, a few other people, I think it was it really, I think we did, we did well. Uh, I wrote the first biography of Willie Mays, and it sold 480,000 copies, which is more than all the other books about Willie Mays put together. Uh, I did uh, the first biography of Sandy Koufax, and that went 14 printings, and is the highest selling uh, young people's book in, in Putnam's history. Uh, I wrote a, the first biography of Roberto Clemente, who was a wonderful guy, I really loved him, uh, and that also sold well. Uh, but Bonnie, Bonnie gets, gets uh, uh, offended, and, and with good reason, that people think that that's what I did, I, I, that I was a sports writer, a baseball writer, and so on. I've written 26 books, uh, and nine of them, I think, are, are, are sports books. So I've written, you know, I wrote a, I wrote a, a biography of, of Sam Houston that's in the Alamo Library. I, I wrote a biography of, of Paul Gauguin that I think is pretty good. I wrote the, I've written under a whole bunch of pseudonyms, so that's one reason why people don't know about these things. I wrote five Western novels including the first novel ever published uh, with a black protagonist. And so, you know, I've done other things besides write sports books. Anyway. I, I was just in, uh, on vacation in China, and I read uh, A Day in the Bleachers and enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that, uh, uh, everybody who, who, who reads it seems to like it. It, it, it sold like cold cakes. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it, 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 but but it, but it's been it's been in print in, in paper covers since 1982, and it is you know, uh, two of the royalty statements last year were minus. <laughs> I owed them money. <laughs> anyway, uh, and and I was flattered when a publishing house up in the Presidio in San Francisco made it the first sports books they had ever published. Uh, they they do fine editions, deluxe editions with the very limited uh, uh, print orders, 400, 400 copies, and they sell the book for $700 each. So anyway, they, they did my book, and that was very flattering. Eric Jessen. Thank you. A uh, couple of reflections and a couple of questions, Arnold. Sure. First of all, back to the Pitts family. Eli, number two child, and I went to Long Beach State together before uh -huh. he was admitted to Stanford to get his PhD. When he did, he, I believe it was in interna international relations, and he, he wound up working for the State Department in Saudi Arabia. Uh -huh. He quickly became fluent in, in Arabic. Uh, you mentioned Supreme Court uh, Justice William O. Douglas. Of course, many of us know that his niece, Mary Douglas, lives here in Laguna Beach and was a, uh, I think, one of the early members of the board of Laguna Greenbelt. Um, now to my questions. Who succeeded Ed Lohr? Uh, 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 Carl Johnson. Okay. And can you reflect anything about your relationship with Vern Spitaleri? <laughs> Thank you. One, is, is Vern here? <laughs> uh, uh, Vern Spitaleri. was the publisher of the Laguna uh, News Post. Uh, Bud Desenberg had sold the paper. Bud and, Bud and John Weld had sold the Laguna Post 
to uh, Bill Ottaway, and he eventually s uh, sold it or gave it to uh, to Vern Spitalari. Uh, and uh, he was the major negative in, uh, uh, person about the the high rise of the fight. He 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 spoke here. I heard him speaking here to to say the opposite that he had really supported us who who, who presented the. Uh, uh, the petitions and, and wanted to to stop the high rise thing, but he, he his paper was filled with negative uh, material about us and about the the uh, uh, the fight. Vern Vern is a friend of mine today. He is a dear man. He says he says to me that oh you've mellowed, and uh, and I, I I think I think I think he's probably right. I have mellowed to some degree. You could tell tonight, of course. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I think Vern is is quite dear and and uh, and I'm, I I just think that he just forgot a little bit about the nasty stuff that he that he had his writer Chuck Ramsey write about us when Chuck Ramsey uh, appeared at the party after the election uh, that night uh, and he came uh, one of our supporters saw him and we had two decks leading out of, of our house and uh, about 40 feet down uh, and he, he picked up Chuck, it was Chuck Ramsey, and he held him over it and, oh. he, uh, and, and, and Chuck said, but I brought a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> and so Frank Maxwell put him down, dusted him off and the party continued. <laughs> anyway, I, 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 today I like, I like, but I, I like just about everybody. So I, I like Vern. Hi, Tom Arnold. Osborne. Arnold, uh, I love Tom Osborne. Hi, you may have, have answered the question I want to ask already. Um, I, I think you're a wonderful writer and a very interesting person. <laughs> Over <laughs> the past uh, 50 years, who are the, say, two or three most interesting people in Laguna that you've met, known and? Well, uh, uh, Start, <laughs> starting with the women. Uh, Bobby Minkin is really a love. I, I, I think she's wonderful, and she's here. Uh, 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 Gavi Cravath, uh, uh, you know, there used to be a court right here in this room, uh, met once a week, and Gavi would hear, Gavi Cravath was, was, his real name was Clifford something Cravath, and the Gavi was spelled G-A-V-V-Y, which was a mistake because he had been a baseball player, and he had hit a fly ball in the Pacific Coast League. They hit a seagull in the throat, and the seagull fell dead to the uh, diamond. And a seagull in, in Spanish is gaviota. And they called, started calling him Gavi and Gaviota, but that has just one V. And so but we, he had two Vs. Anyway, Gavi Cravath uh, 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 would roll up his sleeves, <laughs> six feet, 210 pounds, and he'd pick up a gavel, and it was as though he was picking up a baseball club. And, uh, and you better be nice uh, when, when Gavi was, was deciding your fate, because otherwise you were going to spend some time either in the, in the clinker or, or, or paying a fine or doing something. But Gavi Kavath was, I, I, I really liked him. Anyway, who, who else? Uh, Roy Holm was, was, a, was a bright and wonderful guy with a great smile. Uh, he used to work at Fleur, and he would come home after, after a tough day there as the, I think he was the personnel manager. That's when per they call it personnel before they call it human relations. Resources. Resources. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, and when he entered the canyon, he, he would say that was like my first martini. And, 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 and I've, I've, I usually add, unfortunately, it was not his only. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but he, he, was, he was a great guy, great guy. Anyway, uh, my wife is a pretty great person. You better great come up with a woman before I sit down. Well, my wife, uh, 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 she, she, is, she has been my support, and, uh, and she's been a great person for Laguna Beach with the Heritage Committee and Village Laguna and other things. My name's Ruth Gluckson. You don't know that, I don't think. Oh, Ruth Gluckson. Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, I met Arnold and Bonnie in the early 70s when I first came to Laguna, and I want to know, how come you didn't go into writing comedy? Writing the what? Comedy. The hearing <laughs> you tonight. <laughs> uh, uh, missed your calling. <laughs> no, no I, I think you just haven't read my, my columns all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, 
Uh, somebody once said to me after one of these things, gee, you, you, should, you should do stand-up comedy. And I said, I would if I, would if I could stand up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> so so are, we, are we finished? Well, wait, wait a second. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I have questions. Uh, <laughs> I so you, you mentioned your, uh, Dave Connell uh, providing some assistance, uh, your broken back. Uh, well, what, what, is well, that I, serving in the Army? What, what's well, yeah, but if, yeah, I, I was run over by a, 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 a truck. You heard, of, you heard about friendly uh, fire? I had friendly tire. <laughs> it was one of our own trucks uh, had, had run. <laughs> I just made that up. That's uh, pretty good. B b you have missed your caller. B b Bonnie hates puns. That's because she can't make them. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was I was run over. Um, it was an error by by the captain uh, uh, who was in charge of the. Thing. It was an amphibious exercise at Fort Ord, and uh, we would we would drag the, the, the guns down to the beach and they're dragging back up and do that over and over and over again and with a 10 minute break in be, uh, every hour uh, and, uh, and he would, he, the captain would say, okay, fall out, then we'd fall out, then he'd tell the truck driver to move because when, when we had a 10 minute break, we would lean against the truck and we would sleep. Uh, a GI back then, if he had a 10 minute break, he could sleep nine and a half minutes. There was never, never any problem. So anyway, uh, he forgot to say, around midnight, he forgot to say fall out, and he told the guy to move, and I was closest to the truck, and, and a tire ran over my ankle and back. Uh, I, I didn't feel the back, because the, the pain in the ankle was so terrific, I never knew it ran over my back until I got out of the hospital two weeks later, and I got my backpack, and I took, opened it up, and the, the, uh, the, the uh, mess kit was, I could slip it under the door. It was, it was that flat, and it bit it on my back. And, and, and so it, it, it broke some of the, uh, the, you know, it took some of the pressure off my back. I, I, got, I did get a new mess kit. Uh, uh, but I, I, I didn't tell people then that I, that my, I had suffered this back injury. Uh, and I went, into, I went into combat. I did all those other things. And, uh, but then recently I thought, gee, you know, it, my back is still terrible. It gets worse and worse. And, and so I, so I talked about it, and, and Dave Connell told me how to go about applying and, and getting. Uh, uh, I, I, I am 40% uh, disabled. That's ridiculous. I'm not 40% disabled, but that's what I am officially. Uh, uh, a, a nurse practitioner said to me, uh, how is your hearing? Bonnie and I were in the room, and she, I said, it's okay. Bonnie said, no, it's not. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then so she said to, to us, when did you lose your hearing? <laughs> I had not realized I had lost my hearing. <laughs> I started looking around to see where, anyway, uh, she, uh, so, so uh, uh, she said, what were you in? I said, in the field artillery. She said, that's when you lost your hearing. The, uh, she said, the big guns? I said, yes, the big guns. And she's right to that degree. They, they, they would, you know, I, I, I would fire a, a battalion of guns. I got to be important enough to do something like that. And, uh, uh, and I, I guess maybe it did blow some holes into that. Anyway, so. You uh, mentioned uh, the village entrance uh, project, and, and uh, of course, uh, Laguna Beach is interesting. There's only three ways into town from North Coast Highway, South Co Coast Highway, and uh, Laguna Canyon Road. And uh, the village entrance, it would be very nice to have a gorgeous uh, canyon and entrance into the city. But at some point, somebody made the decision to move the industry out into the canyon. When, when did that happen and was, was I there don't, any? I don't know, it, it seemed always happening, so I don't know. Uh, uh, Talonix and, and uh, uh, that uh, frozen food outfit. Uh, 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 Langloy. Uh, Langloy, uh, yeah, the, I don't know, I don't know how, it, I, I, I'm not big on, on zoning law. Uh, ask Ann Johnson. Uh, Ann, are you here? Yeah, we have Ann in the house. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, okay, but where, where are we in terms of time? We have plenty of time. Uh, we might spend the night. Uh, we, um, <laughs> we mentioned, uh, you, you know, that uh, history not always required a committee. Uh, I'm also on the board of the Laguna Canyon Conservancy, which was founded by uh, uh, former Mayor Lita Lenny, mm -hmm. and she had a quote from uh, uh, the anthropologist Margaret Mead that she, uh, she quoted very often, 
And uh, she said, never doubt that a small group of uh, thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Never doubt that. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. I think, I th I think she's close to being right. It's, it's, it's a great exaggeration, but, it, but it's wonderful. And uh, uh, I, I, Lita Lenny was just a, a, a wonderful human being. And uh, why she has not been able to get her name onto some part of the, the canyon, she, she was so important on the, on the walk and on other parts of saving the canyon. There, there ought to be a Lita Lay, or, or L-E-A, or Lee, whatever it is. There'll be a, a leader Lee out there someplace or other named after her. So. Here, comes, here comes a thoughtful, thoughtful question. Dr. Hano, thank you for uh, your time tonight. A couple, couple questions. Uh, one has to do with the monstrosity that's built over, uh, over Diver's Cove. If you go to Scandia Bakery, and you look at the photograph, and it's just striking how it jets out over the rocks, unlike any other structure. It seems like it was built in the 60s, if you know anything about the story behind that. And then the wonderful little park no. up on top of the world where I live is, is actually has a little plaque uh, named after Wilcox, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about, about him, and maybe you know anything about the, the park that he... Uh, Got this plaque uh, put up. Is it a, is it Bill Wilcoxon? Is, yeah. Is it, oh. uh, so those are the two questions. Okay. Thank thank you. I can't answer the first one, and I can barely answer the second one. But I but I did I did know and 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 liked and worked with Bill Wilcoxon. He was a he he was our pro bono uh, lawyer during the high rise fight, and uh, uh, and I, the pro bono means we weren't paying him anything, and but. We had to have some money somehow or other, and we would get some money that would come in at our Tuesday night meetings. We'd open the envelope, and sometimes we'd have a whole $12.18 in there. And I remember one day, one Tuesday evening, Bill walked in. He didn't attend all our meetings, but he walked in. He saw the money. He scooped it up and walked out. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was his pro bono uh, uh, life. Uh, uh, when, 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 uh, uh, when there was an appeal against our having that, holding that election, because in, the, in those days, the problem was you, you couldn't use uh, the initiative process to change a zone, to amend a zone, to do zoning. And this looked pretty close to be doing that. Actually, it wasn't doing that. It, we, were, we were amending something in the building code, uh, uh, and I, I really meant to bring copies of the initiative with me, cause th then I could give them all out to you. Uh, we'll one do that page, next one time. One next time, thank you. Uh, any, anyway. Uh, there was an appeal to a judge down in San Diego, and, and he, he, he said uh, the, this, this election is illegal, and it was called off. And Vern Spitalari wrote a very uh, uh, th thank you. I was so, so glad to hear that we finally had some good sense and blah, blah, blah. And Bill Wilcoxon put on his nine-league boots, and he went down there, and, and he gathered up a, an appellate court judge of some sort, and he said... What, what is illegal? We haven't had an election. You know, nothing's happened. We haven't, it hasn't been passed. It hasn't, been, it hasn't won. It hasn't lost. Uh, and you can't stop people from voting, can you? And, and so the judge said, no, you can't. And we had the election. Uh, it, it, uh, Vern Tashner, the, the, the man who, who the dogs urinated on, uh, uh, he, he carried on uh, uh, to an appellate. He, he, he fought it after the election. And he, he lost it at one at a superior court level. Then he took it to an appellate court, and he won. Uh, and, and so therefore, the, but fortunately, the, the council had passed the, the initiative after the election. They had taken the same words and put it into an ordinance. Uh, not as, not as, that's, that's not as likely to hold up as, as an initiative thing, but they, they did that. Roy Holm did that. Uh, then, uh, but then somebody else fought that, that ruling that and you couldn't use the initiative to change the zone. And, one before the California State Supreme Court, and uh, there is a footnote to that opinion that uh, Bill Wilcoxon sent to me, and I've got it someplace again in my uh, files. Uh, the, court, the appellate court erred in the case of Tashina versus Laguna Beach, and so it's back to, uh, I assume that puts it back into legality, although I don't know whether footnotes are, are the same as a, a legal, uh, anyway. So what else, guys? L line up. We don't appreciate the Good dead evening, time. Good evening, Arnold. Thank you for this. 
Maybe this is an obvious question, but with your depth of knowledge, your involvement